Chapters two and three in my book <clears throat> are related. Chapter two is basically a summary of physics, physical thing, physical processes as we know it. And it's been laid down by, you know, some of the great scientists. Then though, I mean, to realize these are the law of physics and one thing, but how to put them together to make an engineering problem to be solved is chapter three. So they're related sections, but we, the practical engineer, we're not, you know, I love physics for its own sake, don't get me wrong, but we're the practical engineer. We have to put this together to get the equations that we need to solve. So in this chapter, and, and you know, it's, it's interesting here, this list like introduction here, I got thinking about stuff and, and really, I mean, we humans call things by like, some things are thermal, you know, whatever. Some things are electrical, biological, stuff, And we break ourselves into departments like that, the mechanical engineering problem, the chemical engineering, et cetera. But you know, nature doesn't do that. Nature's processes just occur. You know, you can't, there's not, you, you ever talk to mother nature? You can't go up to her and say, um, um, can I talk to somebody in your chemical engineering department? What? Man, we just let it just flows. And that's a kind of a actual an issue with experiments and modeling, but experiments particularly, you know, let's say you want to um, do an experiment on some mechanical features only, you know, the stress, strain, the position, velocity, then things get in, but you can't help say some chemistry, some reactions are occurring. And you don't want that. You don't want um, things to heat up by friction. Because you say, I'm concentrating on mechanical things, but see, you can't go ask mother nature to say, um, knock on her door and say like, I'm trying to really only study stress, stress strain today. Could you please turn off electrical, chemical, and thermal things? So that makes, I'm kind of, it's kind of silly the way I'm describing it, but it makes for a challenge for you and us, the engineers, because when we model a system, we have to say, you know, we have to determine which, and by insight, which are the main physics going on? Can I legitimately um, neglect thermal things? Or is that a bad assumption? And uh, to get the simplest model possible. So we, the engineer, have to be concerned about that. And then of course, all the combined processes, the thermal, mechanical, all those kind of things, you know, the, the things. So anyway, the process of mathematical modeling, the process uh, on a, com a complex process, if, it, if you have a complex process, it does involve science, but it also, and art, insight. And sometimes, sometimes, I mean, you just need some luck. And you know, the most talented people in the world, they can work hard and they're really smart. But sometimes, man, you don't, a little bit of luck helps. I mean, it's hard to come by. So um, anyway, so what I'm gonna do here is briefly go over these things. Again, when we need them through the rest of the course now, like I, although I'm gonna briefly roar through them today, then when we're doing a problem, you know, in two weeks from now, and I say, no, this is a thing, I'll, I'll keep going back to the, to the physics. But um, I organize things by conservation laws, that is, and it was sort of conservation of, of mass, momentum, energy, chemical species, and charge. And I've challenged people to identify something else in our universe to add to this list. This isn't like just some of the five most important ones. I couldn't think of anything else. So these are conservation laws and these are, as these are the, the heart of mathematical modeling. For instance, Newton's law, you all know about that. And these are general principles independent of the material. That is, energy is conserved whether the material is a metal or a polymer or a gas. However, the rate of interaction, the rate of transport tends to be different in a metal, a plastic, an insulator, a, a solid, a liquid, et cetera. The, the rate of heat flow, the rate of you know, viscous shear, all these things and, and electrical conduction tend to be different. So you can't just say electrical charge is conserved. That is true, but the details of how it flows make a difference if it's a copper wire 
and the and the geometry of the copper wire and the different things. And so we supplement the um, conservation laws, what we call rate principles. One of the most far famous is Fourier's heat conduction law. I don't know, maybe a few of you have taken ME 3304 heat transfer, um, but that'll be after the professor introduces their name and a thing, you know, probably the third day or something of that course you'll see, or maybe even the first day you'll see, you'll see, uh, see good old Fourier. Hmm. Let's do this again. Fourier's law. Fourier was some dude about 200 years ago, Joseph Fourier. Some of these are named after people, some are named after the physics, you know. And like the heat convection named after I, Newton. Newton seems to get a lot of stuff. Wasn't he the coolest dude? Oh my God. Um, viscous shear. So when we need one of these, like I will almost certainly, we're, we're thinking of giving you one in heat conduction, for instance, his next homework here. Um, we'll explain it to you. You know, you haven't had the whole course at ME3304, at least not supposed to have. So whatever you need to know about Fourier's Law, we'll give you a little explanation there. It's not like you can't do the homework if you haven't taken your junior level courses. So we'll never do that to you. But uh, we, we think it's never too early to introduce the, the various laws of physics <clears throat> and turn you loose on them there, right? Um, in addition, you're going to need property relationships. Now, fortunately, under the range of parameters, often a constant property is a good approximation because that simplifies things. And we'll do mostly that in this course. But there are... Um, situations where the properties are variable. For instance, density. If, if you have a solid, the density is pretty much constant with pressure and temperature. I mean, things do expand a little bit when they heat up, but such a small amount, you can usually neglect it. You know, and, and, but if it's, if it's a gas, for instance, a gas can be very compressible. And the change in density or specific volume with temperature and pressure might be important. So here you might use the ideal gas law or something like that, or a higher one of the higher, more accurate ones, you know. Um, oh, I was just about to ask if we'd be allowed to assume ideal gas for most of our problems. Yeah, and, and in that regard, because this the numerical part, the, the physics part, for instance, if we have, and we can only choosing only, let's say like 10 weeks of homeworks and things, I mean, I know it's a lot to do, but in the, in the scope of what we could ask and all the applications, it's a paltry small amount. I mean, you didn't cover this and you didn't cover that. Yeah, I know, but we only had the you know, 15 weeks, you know, it's enough already. So when it comes to a problem, let's say we choose one and we want you to use the ideal gas law, we will tell you specifically, we'll give you, you know, please use the, you know, what it'll be definite for you. We, you won't have to guess on that one or, you know, whatever. So we're going to help you out with that stuff. You know, like I said, we don't expect you to be seniors and have taken all that stuff. We know this, this course has a 2000 number to it. That means you're sophomores, right? Um, but, but nevertheless, just because you haven't had heat transfer doesn't mean we're gonna shy away from it. We're gonna give you what you want, for instance, next week. Okay. Now, these next sections, like 2.3 goes into a little bit more detail about the conservation laws, 2.4 about the rate laws. So I'm not gonna pour over every Symbol, except that, um, let me mention a couple of them at least. Um, in engineering, and this is good for you guys to know, in engineering, we work with systems that are closed to mass, closed systems, that means mass cannot flow into or out of them, and open systems where there's inlet ports or exit ports, or it's a control volume in the fluid out there, mass can flow into it. Um, and there's the two approaches there. Now, if it's a closed system, the derivative of mass is zero, but by definition, that means mass can't flow in. But if it has inlet and exit ports, the change in mass with time now is equal to the summation of the flows in minus the summation of the flows out. So the conservation laws you see here are like checkbook balances. The change in my money equals the total number of deposits minus the total checks plus maybe some interest, whatever. This, these conservation laws are checkbook balances, but instead of balancing the money in your checking account, we're balancing mass, momentum, energy, chemical species, and charge. 
electric charge. I think there's a picture that goes with this. So there you go, an open system. You know, if these two things flow in, though, and that one flows out, you know, you, you, you add them up. Just like this is your bank account. Stuff is coming in, a lot of stuff going out, and oh, I'm broke. Another, another famous one is attributed to the great Isaac Newton. Newton um, amazes me beyond all belief, but anyway, um, he, he's somehow, some way, I think that apple tree thing is a bunch of malarkey, but one way or the other, he noticed that the momentum of a system, that is its mass times its velocity, seems to stay constant. Like, it'll, like that mass will continue going at that same speed and same direction if I don't mess with it. But if I do mess with it, if I touch it, push it, pull it, if I put some external force on the system, a net external force, that that momentum will change according to this relationship here. And thereby came arguably the most important and practical expression, certainly for mechanical engineers, you know, here. Now, it's a vector expression, so let's just work with the X component. You know, you, you do this in the X, Y, and Z. Um, which you can, you know, the way this. Now, if it's a closed system, and, you know, I like the name, like, closed system. I don't like some European scientist name because then I have to remember to see oil. But if you tell me the word closed system, I know what that means. Anyway, it's called that sometimes. But when it's closed, mass is constant. So you see mass can come outside. When mass is like a single number the whole way, it comes outside of derivative. So there you go. And when you have a closed system, we get your famous F equals MA, when it has X and Y components. On the other hand, if the system, F equals that, that, that conservation of momentum still applies, but if there's inlet and exit ports, for instance, there's some M dot velocity X flowing in exit inlet port one dot dot, there's exit port two and three. If, if there's ways that mass can cross the boundary, it might be just a uh, like an artificial control volume, or it might actually have little inlet pipes, either one. Um, then momentum can change, not just because of the external forces, but because momentum is being added and taken away, you see. If this is the money in the gray area, there might be some force pushing money in, but then, there's an inlet port here, you know, there comes money piling in, you got a job, your parents giving you money, and there it goes out, you know, tuition, beer, you know, uh, uh, oh, wait, y'all are too young, sorry about that. Cancel that, uh, cancel the beer, get rid of this one. But you know, stuff important, right? And so we have these two forms. Um, generally, I'd say, though, in terms of which one do you use, if you have solid mechanics, like a projectile, you know, you're, you're, you're throwing a baseball or shooting a, a mortar or something like that, or a, a solid object. The mass is all collected and stays together, right? I mean, you got a pulley on a system, all the, all the particles stay together unless the thing breaks. So it's possible to follow that group of material the whole way and, and do this thing where mass is constant. However, if you have an, like a fluid system, you can't tag, you, you can, I mean, I say the air in your room right now, you could um, get some, it looks all clear, you could get some red dye and then one little control volume of, of a little blob of your room put red dye on that spot. But do you see that red spot, that little red area of, of dye going around as a group? No, you see it all spread out. You see it start to turn pink and eventually diffuse around to the whole room so you can't see anything. So following groups of particles doesn't make sense like it does over here in solid mechanics. You know, the baseball, the, the particles in the baseball all stay together by and large during the course of the, you know, the pitching and the hitting and all that stuff. So this makes sense when you can do it. But for a, studying the fluid motion and, and interactions in your room, it doesn't make sense. So that's what you get. You have two major, um, two major at least branches of mechanical engineering. 
the thermal fluid system guys and the solid mechanics guys. So usually the solid mechanics do, do the closed system because it makes more sense and the sort of thermal fluid guys do the open system because that makes more sense for those problems. Anyway, as problems are assigned to you in this course, if there's uh, some subtlety like that, you know, we will try to explain and help you. Um, sometimes then our problem explanations get a little long, but we, we will um, try to help you with if any issue like that or suggest what to do there, you know, so you don't have to, again, it's not like you're seniors. Okay, and so there you go. And then you have conservation of energy, you have all sorts of stuff. I, I mean, I'll, I'll when, when it's relevant, I'll come back to these. Same with the rate equations. When they're relevant, I'll come back, but I'll mention one of them right now, Fourier's law. And this is a good start for heat transfer. ME3304, you'll see this, um, was it the second day of heat transfer? So you can see this again. But let's take a block of material like this. And let's say this surface that just over here is hot. It's maintained hot. And this surface, this gray area here, this one is cold. That's the area. Okay, 200 years ago, Joseph Fourier made the outstanding observation that first of all, heat flow, there's this thing called thermal energy, it flows. And it flows from hot things to cold things, okay? Just like a ball will naturally roll downhill from high elevation to low elevation, it tends to do that. So he noticed that the heat flow, this heat, then this is a flux, that is an amount per area, which you can do. But he noticed that this term here was proportional to the temperature difference. That is, a, if T hot to minus T cold is big, you get a lot. If T hot and T cold are the same number, you get nothing. So he noticed that, but he made the other revelation that's very important, that this has a wall has a length L, that not only does the heat flux proportional to hot to cold, but it's inversely proportional to the distance between those two points. I think that was his outstanding observation at the time. That is, if a hot surface and a cold surface are very close to each other, you'll get more heat transfer than you would if that same hot and cold surfaces were spread out. So it's not just temperature difference, but it's temperature gradient. And, and we see then on and on, in our physical sciences, it's gradient that makes a difference. Not just, dip, not just potential difference, but it's the gradient, the derivative with T. He also noticed that, so he knows that this is a, a, the case, but he also noticed that different materials give you different amount of heat transfer, let's say under the same conditions. He knows, gee, I get more out of metal than I do out of other. So he therefore formulated, proposed a property this is one of the property relations in thermal conductivity, we call it now, um, that characterizes the materials. So for instance, metals have the highest, a, a nice pure diamond is probably one of the highest we can ever get. Um, a ceramic or plastic has, you know, 10 to 100 times lower. And then even much lower yet for thermal conductivity is still air. So still air has a very low thermal conductivity. So um, a great insulator is still air. That's why, you know, you put fiberglass insulation. It's not the fiberglass, it's those materials capturing that thick layer of still air. That's why double pane windows work. That's why double pane windows are effective. They, um, not because there's more glass, but because the two panes of glass capture still air between them. And air has a, a still air, moving air now, but still air, and you capture still air between the two panes of glass, that's why double pane windows are so much more effective than a single pane. It has very little to do with the additional glass. So if you took that same two panes and stuck them together one window, it wouldn't be near as good. The minus sign in here is because the ball rolls downhill. The, ball, the minus sign is there because heat flows from hot to cold, not cold to hot. If you don't put the minus sign in, you've got heat spontaneously popping from hot, cold areas to hot areas. The ball spontaneously somehow rolls to the top of the hill. And that's so. So the, the, it's like, it's a K. You should really, if you want to look at this, really, you should put minus dt dx. The minus really goes with that. But we always write it this way. 
Okay, so we'll use that in our homework coming up for this week. And throughout the course, if we need another one of these rules, again, I won't pour over them here now, all of them, but if we need some more of these rules, we'll direct you to this section. Please read that and help you out with them. Viscous stuff and binary mass diffusion and electrical stuff and Hooke's Law. Good God, look at all this great stuff. Here's a cool little table I made. But anyway, uh, on these, these, rate, these diffusion rate equations, um, here's the first one, heat conduction. You can put them all in the form of a conserved quantity gradient times the diffusivity. So really they all match the same, a similar form, heat conduction, viscous fluid shear, binary mass diffusion. Ohm's law, really Ohm's, uh, Ohm's law is, could be cast in this form too. Um, this table can go on of course with other entries. Um, so, I mean, you'll be using, you'll be, this, the, what I just roared through right now, you'll be using various combination of those for the rest of your academic and, and depending what you do for a job, you know, professional career, you know. I mean, those are, those are the laws of physics. I mean, we, you know, you might end up just some other aspect of, of engineering, you know, technical sales or something where you just, you know, have to be good at playing golf and, and drinking liquor or something. I don't know, but um, uh, most of us are, a lot of you guys are going to be doing, uh, doing some tough computer work there. Okay, so those are the laws and th those are the rules sort of that, nature seems to have. Um, as a matter of interest, before we turn to chapter three, which is really what we need to put them together, uh, let's take one of these. So here you go. Let's take our old classic F equals MA. Does anybody, has anybody ever followed the proof of this? You've seen F equals MA clearly in your in high school, both high schools for sure, high school physics and in class. And I think by this time, most of you are supposed to have taken statics too. But um, does anybody remember the proof? You probably didn't see a proof because you can't prove it. Some guy first suggested, it just happens to be his name was Isaac Newton, but the fact is somebody suggested this and, and it came because he noticed it in the world around him. Period. And since you know, and and who says it's right? Well, you you can't. It's called a it's it's called a postulate, right? It's an unprovable truth. And for many many years, we thought it was an absolute truth because um, you know thousands upon millions of observations of physical phenomena occurring in each one, plus or minus the experimental uncertainty, it turned out that F was equal to ma. So it seems like Newton was the man. But then along came Einstein, who showed that at actually F equals MA is a good approximation for speeds below, um, that are not near the speed of light. And that things, you know, you get relativistic effects. Well, you know, most of our engineering examples are much less than the speed of light. Some of the ways some of y'all draw and drive, I'm not quite sure about that, but uh, by and large, you know, less than the speed of light. So, for the engineering world we live in, this is pretty much an absolute truth that could be verified over it. But it's all a hypothesis. You can't prove it. We just have to accept it. So if you want to accept mechanical and just say you argue, I don't think that, I think Newton was a quack. Okay, but you know, you're gonna fail statics, dynamics, you're gonna fail a lot of courses if you don't act like you believe this, you know? Use it for your equations. All right. Um, now, I want to, oh, I want to go this back. I hope I don't kill my whole, whole thing there. Okay, good. Modeling chapter three, We're starting on chapter three. All right. Now, I'm not going to go everything here. I, I'm, I'm going to save some of the material here for a just-in-time kind of thing. Um, sometimes there's really interesting material here, but if you don't see why you need it right now, um, it's not worth, you know, it's just lost. 
um, and I'll do some of this material. I'll only present, I'll talk about it when I present a homework problem or something where you need it. But I'm gonna talk about some of this stuff in here. And in general physical processes, I mean, I guess for general physical processes, you're looking for some kind of mathematical solution. That is, that is, you're looking for some kind of a, a function. You want the dependent variables, that is, you want the output position and velocity or voltage or whatever to be a function of the independent variables, that's space and time. System parameters, that's like its geometry, like its lengths and its materials, like metals, and what you do to it, forcing functions. You want to have some, you want to develop some kind of means to have a computation, a function, a method to input this set of stuff and it cranks and grinds around and outputs for you what you're looking for, the output voltage or the motion of the spring mass damper. The spring mass damper, by the way, is the only problem in that when I teach this course, I cover every time because it's so important. You see it so many times. Um, I, I cover a lot of things, but I'll, I'll, all the other stuff is up for discussion except for that one. Okay, so how do we do this? I mean, and I love this little, little uh, box here. And I think it's good to think in terms of this way. Also, it might help you sort out stuff from later courses, certainly controls and a few other things. But a system is concerned, like, here you pick it up, you know, um, somebody referred to the sword on the wall behind me. So it's the sword. You pick it up, you see it's, you see it's geometry, right? It's long, it's got things. It's physical, it's material properties. You know, it's some metal. And you're going to be doing, you're going to be using it in battle. So the physical processes are F equals MA. So you want to see how that sword responds um, to inputs. And inputs can be forces, you know, volumetric forces, that is volumetric heating or gravity. It can be boundary forces, like pushing into surfaces. And it also can be initial conditions. That is, mm, to get something going, you can elevate it in a gravity field, or you can make it cold or hot, or you can, you know, put a high voltage on something and let it go. The initial conditions in, in this system, it'll start doing things. And then, so here's the system, you do something to it, one or more of these things could have initial conditions plus L, and it will respond. That is, heat will flow, as you'll learn in 3304. Motion will occur. You've got several courses of dynamics. You're going to take, you've got a couple electric circuit courses. The flows are stuff like heat, potential is temperature. The flows could be current, the potentials are voltage, etc. It just depends which course you happen to be sitting in at that time. But actually, and it's, it's sort of amazing, you know, you, uh, I don't see any different, I don't see any relationship between mechanical, thermal, and electrical courses I've taken, and, and I sort of disagree. I think just after you have a reasonable idea of the laws of physics, it's kind of you're just doing the same thing, five different classes, you know. I mean, there's a lot of detail, easier said than done. I'm not trivial, trivializing the task at hand for you guys. I mean, it's easy, a lot easier said than, than done because you're a lot of detail to study, but you're kind of doing the same thing in each of your classes. Um, so I have some details of mechanical and thermal things, for instance. Um, so like in, over here in thermal processes, some of the properties might be thermal conductivity, the one we just discussed, specific heat density. Um, some of the inputs might be volumetric, like electrical heating, chemical reactions. It could be, you know, microwave heating of a potato kind of thing. Boundary inputs could be like put the potato in a microwave oven and apply flux or, or elevate the temperature. And then initial conditions could be that, you know, the thing was out of equilibrium. It was either hot or cold to start with. So anyway, some combination of these things are done to a system with its specific geometry and things. And then what happens is temperature rises or rises or fall and heat flows appropriately. 
as the temperatures rise and fall, the heat will flow from the hot ones to from the hot areas to the cold areas, and you'll have a thermal process. And you know that makes up that makes up a big chunk of mechanical engineering, as I was alluded to earlier. The two main topics in mechanical engineering are thermal things, this thing, and mechanical things, this one. So anyway, we'll have fun. Um, to make a mathematical, now we're we'll talking about mathematical modeling. Now, you, I think for a mathematical model, you know, you can do some of these in different orders, except I think with system selection. I mean, you can't start to identify the geometry, the materials, the processes, and what's going on until you identify what system I'm working on. It's like, could you solve the system? Well, could you be a little more specific? Could you not be a little more specific? Could you be specific, exactly specific about the system you're talking about? It's this thing sitting here. Oh, okay, now I know the details. Okay, now you can go on. You see, you know, you know, if you just, it's ridiculous because now you can start to identify processes that you think are important. Hopefully some simplifying assumptions, boundary and input things, and all that goes into a model. And so I, I think these two, well, if you actually start to do it, you really need to um, probably do it in this order. And as you need to, after the system, all important system, you need to say what you think is happening that's important. Then based on that, oh, I think I can make some simplifications. That makes you, by the way, a good engineer. The good engineer is the one who can take a complex problem and identify it and, and simplify it in a mathematically accurate way so that the initial very difficult problem is now much easier. That's not somebody that's trying to avoid you know, doing the task. That's, that's, a, that's the kind of engineer I want to hire. You know, and those other things. So anyway, you put all that stuff in there and you end up with a model. You have all sorts of combinations, as you'll see over the years, and we'll help you with in this course if whatever you need. Okay. Now, now you get to the complete mathematical model. And the model, the mathematical model ends up usually as a governing some kind of a governing algebra or differential equation. You know, the last part of the course is with the differential equations. Some of the models are steady state, steady state things with just algebra equations. And so it just depends. <clears throat> All important though, you have to have the boundary conditions and you have to have the initial conditions. These, you know, many people think that the, uh, the important part and, and the, probably the most, I guess, the important part is the physics and the uh, here. But without the boundary and initial conditions, you cannot uniquely solve the problem because you don't have enough information. So, for instance, let's take our all-time classic of mechanical vibrations. And here's this picture that you've seen various versions of before. We have a mass. Now it's a solid, so it's all keeps, it all stays together. See, it's like a sprit, some kind of a thing that stays together. So we can certainly use closed mass system on this and use F equals MA. But it's being acted on by an force here. This is somebody grabbing it and pulling. It's got a little spring thing attached. It's got a damper. And your objective, based on these known inputs of that force and these system parameters, your objective is to find the motion X, possibly velocity. You probably might want velocity also. The motion of this system based on this. So it's a force thing. So we would guide ourselves to probably Newton's second law for a closed system, F equals MA. Then, now this is not a law of physics, but this is like a practical tool for solving problems. It's called the free body diagram. What you do is you take, now that you've identified that this, this mass is my focus, now you know how big it is, now you know the, the, uh, the stuff about it. You kind of have this instantaneous process where you, or some wire cutter 
clips that spring off, snip, and a force, a identical force is instantly replaced there. See, like, and if this is you, if, if, if this is you, the human being being vibrated, I mean, some spring is attached to you and somebody cut the spring off, but instantly put the same force. You don't, you don't feel the difference, right? Same with the damper, same with this force here. This is called the free body diagram. Again, it's a great tool. It's a great tool to analyze these dynamics problems. Um, but it's not all physics. It's just, it's just one of those great ways to looking at things. So please include the free body diagram in your repertoire when you do these things. But anyway, with the free body diagram in hand, we can now easily apply Newton's second law, F equals MA. We have chosen X this way as positive. Um, be careful of the details, like if you choose X down to be positive. Now that's, that's not a law of physics either. This is not a law of physics, this is a human choice. If you choose down, stick with it. If you choose up, which is just as valid, Stick with it. The only thing is, you can't change horses in midstream. You go, oh, but I think this, and so because you'll end up with sign problems, right? If you if the sign is wrong. So uh, I chose down. Whether you like it or not, it's tough luck. I chose down, and and I put the stuff in my system there, the system parameters, and I do a little F equals a M A on this thing. Downward pointing arrows are in the plus direction. They get pluses. Upward are in the negative. They get negatives. And lo and behold. We apply mass times acceleration to some of the forces. There's mass times acceleration. Acceleration is two derivatives of position. The damping term was down, so negative. The springy term was down, it gets negative. And the force was put in there as a positive, positive direction. Note that plus F of T, F of T could evaluate as negative 10 Newtons, which means that the force is pushing up. Also, it could be different amounts during the system. So here we go. We now have one of the most famous equations um, and one of the most useful equations in all of applied engineering and physics. The applications for this little guy right here is really mind boggling. I mean, you could spend, I mean, and some of you are going to be doing a lot with mechanical things and things that vibrate. And some of you all will deal with this equation and various permutations of it and you know, more complicated um, situations, really for your, your technical, your uh, professional career. You know, when you're 50 years old, oh yeah, you know, whatever, you know, a lot more about it. So there we go. There's another version of it there. But let me just say at this point, um, if I was to ask you the question is, if, if your task, and, and before you start MATLAB, before you start computing things, you have to know what it is you're trying to compute. Well, in week whatever it is, 12 or something in this course, we're going to revisit this equation, and we are going to solve it in MATLAB. It would be one of the most singularly useful things you do. I have Students later, you know, contact me. Hey, Professor Vic, I, you know, that, that spring mass you did in 204, I, I need it in my vibrations class, and it's great, but, you know, could, I, I don't know what I did with it. Could you send it to me? You know, I get that all the time. I warn students, hey, what we do with this thing, save every minute of us, save everything you do with it. You know, it's okay. But if the, if the task was derivation, and you handed me, say, I want the math, a complete mathematical model. Notice this thing is called complete mathematical model. If I wanted the complete mathematical model, and all you handed me was that thing in blue, which is not blue, really, if all you did was hand me this thing in blue, you'd get points off. If you just gave up, let's say you gave a person this, this equation, and you told them what mass was, a number, kilograms, told them what C was, a number, tell them what the spring constant, a certain number of newtons per stretch, and told them the force, say, say zero or some other force, so that everything in here is a number but x. You can't solve the problem uniquely because you don't know the initial conditions. And so 
A complete mathematical model has to have the initial conditions. It's second order, so you need two of them. And only knowing how it started can now you take the three of these and come up with a unique solution with numbers. So if you try to solve, we're gonna come up, we're gonna show you how to numerically solve this thing. You'll be able to solve this equation and you'll know a lot more about it by the time this course of. We'll tell, tell you how to do it. OD, just to look to the future. You know, we'll use OD45. That's a, that's a bread and butter solver. That's a, that's a great little, one of the most useful tools. But if you just gave the, this OD45, this information, I mean, it's going to be an error because it's like it's going to have to bark out some kind of message about, I don't know what the message, I can't remember what the message looked like, but it tell you, if you've got to tell it the initial conditions, you know, there's certain syntax to do it, but you have to say that, otherwise the thing can't solve it. You know, you ask, to, you ask MATLAB to solve the thing and it says, you know, well, you know, hey, buddy, if you don't tell me the initial conditions, go to hell, solve it yourself. Hell, I'm not going to do it. I think that's the, I, I think that's the message. You know, go to hell, solve it yourself. I think I don't remember now. You know. Probably not, but something like that. But you see, it needs the initial conditions. This is second order, so it needs two. If it was first order, it needs one. If you had, and we'll probably get to those. If let's say you had two spring masses hooked up, two simultaneous oscillators, so you had X1 and X2 oscillating, wobbling back and forth, you would need four initial conditions. So anyway, we'll get to that one. Um, there's, there's a lot of other stuff. I want to conclude this section. Oh, there's a lot. Oh, man, I just skipping over all this stuff is painful because it's some fun stuff. But um, I'll refer to you. Again. I want to go to the last little thing in here. Come here. Is there a way to capture the entire thing? I don't know. I guess without scrolling like this. Oh, there we go. Now, I'll have this table. Now, everybody lay on their side and look at it sideways. And damn things. Let's see, rotate. This is an interesting little uh, table about with con containing you know, at least one possible classification of physical problems in, in, in types. <clears throat> the first row is linear ones, which are a little bit easier than nonlinear. So put linear there, nonlinear, a little bit more difficult. And the number of independent variables, like one, like your heating and cooling, two, like your oscillators, three, like simultaneous things, including chaos, and then um, collective systems, that is continuous systems, and things like that. So um, we, in this course, are going to show you that, you know, we're going to show you a linear system with one variable, like the change in temperature equals. Um, I'm going to show you a little bit, a little bit on this. The nonlinear ones, you have to take ME 5744, the nonlinear ones, open up a whole world of magnificent applications. But we'll definitely get to this one, two simultaneous equations, which is your linear oscillator, spring mass, the LRC circuits, the all just the applications are endless. Um, and some possible nonlinear ones. Um, we can't cover in by any stretch of imagination everything in this in this thing, but the pendulum is one of my favorites. I I can't go a whole course and not tell you about the pendulum. I love the pendulum. Um, this couple is a bio. Some um, actually, well, anyway, then when you have three or more systems, you can come up with all sorts of of, of interesting problems. For instance, um, where would it be? Chemical, biological problems. Um, I have one that's relevant for today. Um, I'm definitely going to tell you about because it's how do you model a virus? And um, unfortunately, it's a very relevant problem, but it's it's an interesting and challenging mathematical problem with like four or five independent variables. And um, when I first saw it years ago, <clears throat> I thought, oh, that's really interesting. And 
but little did I know that it would become very relevant. But anyway, you get all these complicated problems, and this this table is organized such that, like, you see by the, the easiest ones are on the upper left, the hardest ones are on the lower right. The things in gray, the things in white are pretty much fairly well understood. I mean, there's still work to be done on them research-wise, but they're fairly well understood, like heat conduction, you know, kind of thing. But the ones in gray are more um, still a little bit unknown or still active areas of, of research. You know, some of these extremely difficult nonlinear problems, you know, neural networks, heart cell stuff, all sorts of biological systems, nonlinear, um, all these Josephson junction arrays, um, you know, the nonlinear waves can be a, a beast to st study, you know, earthquakes. This one is one of my favorite areas. Reaction diffusion, you know, how do biological systems grow and interact? Certainly, you know, uh, heart, heart attacks and things like that, turbulent fluids, is always a thing. And maybe down here, life itself, you know, um, I mean, why are we here? And why does life work the way it does? And, you know, I, we're not going to be able to answer that question. Now, unfortunately, 15 weeks later, we can't answer it. We're going to, you know, if you want to know how the, some of this stuff works, I think you're going to come out of this course in real good shape. What is the meaning of life? I'm afraid I, I can't tell you. You know, well, somebody told me it was 42 or something. You know. And why is life the way it is? Why do people grow? Why do things grow and these cells split? And, you know, all the kinds of things that go on. Um, so... That's the ultimate mystery, I think. I have questions on every phase of them. It's just amazing that life exists. Anyway, it doesn't take much to amaze me. Okay, folks. Um, I'm probably about 20 minutes over time. Oh, no, I'm not too bad. I, got, I get excited talking about stuff. Well, only a couple minutes over time, so let's quit it right there. Um, stop share. There we go. And... Um, we can stick on the, stay on the internet here for a little while if anybody has some questions.